God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. You notice I'm not using a microphone that has a cord today. <laughs> We've got some new wireless mics this week. Uh, this is the yesterday, actually, at the Carrie and Mary Ann's wedding was the first opportunity that we had to use them. So uh, listen to these things and let me know what you think. We can make adjustments and try different stuff. I can't hear. You know, I'm up here speaking and all I hear is me, so. Well, all you can hear is me, too, I'm sure. <laughs> but, you know, you can hear me through the speakers. Is all I can hear is me in my head. So let me know what you think. We had just come out of a season of political campaign that was, in, in some ways, uh, just sort of unbelievable. The viciousness of the attacks of candidates on one another. Candidates from both parties, people who are supporters of both parties, major parties, and even some others, saying awful things. And they never, it was as if they never quite got around to talking about the issues of the campaigns. All they could talk about was how evil the other candidate was. It was, it was as if they were saying to us, what I think and what I believe doesn't matter. What you need to know is that this other person hates you, wants your money, wants to get rid of your job, and wants to destroy the country. That's all you need to know. I'm a good guy. That's a bad guy. And the attacks were personal. And the statements taken out of context. And, and ideas and thoughts and actions twisted to the advantages of the candidates. I pray that we will never see that again, but I'm afraid that it's once that genie is out of the bottle, we won't get it back in. There was a time, though, in our country, in our, in our world, where people who held opposing views could sit down together and talk in a civil way. We could have open and honest dialogue in, in a civil way. But now, now, I, I, I just don't understand. It doesn't compute to me. We could sit down with people whom, with whom we disagree and still reach some sort of agreement or compromise about how we should be and act in the world. We could work with others, even people that we didn't like, to try to make life better for all of us. But now, now we seem to have this idea that if the others don't agree with us, they're not just wrong, but there's something wrong with them. They're not just wrong, they're defective. They're demonic. They're hateful, vicious, evil people. And we have to get rid of their way of life. Whatever it is that they stand for, which is all evil, and substitute it with it, with our way, whatever way that is. There's no dialogue, there's no talk, there's just shouting, and whoever says the most vicious things the loudest wins. And I despair for our world, for our nation. It's a sad state of affairs, and even more than that, it's a breathtakingly frightening state of affairs. But the, the, the situation that Paul is addressing in Colossae is also a frightening state of affairs. You see, when we talk about reconciliation, we notice that the, the title of the sermon is Reconciliation and Peace. When we talk about reconciliation, the first person we think of probably is not Paul. In his day, he was one of the most polarizing figures. He was, he was busy drawing distinctions, drawing divisions and lines between the new Christian movement and the old Jewish movement. And he had this agenda. He had this agenda to try to support this new movement, 
but very often at the expense of his own past in some ways. He's not a person you think of in terms of reconciliation. His mission was to bring non-Jews into God's vision, a place where they had not found welcome before. It was his mission to, to create this new movement. And if he had to step on Jewish toes, well, he wasn't afraid to do that. He spoke in black and white terms. And he alienated a lot of good people to try to bring into being this new way. So putting the name of Paul into a sentence with the word reconciliation is not immediately obvious. And not an immediately obvious thing to do. You see, the church at Colossae was in trouble. The, the writer doesn't, the apostle doesn't tell us precisely what was going on. But from hence in the text, it seems as if the people in Colossae, which is a town in Asia Minor, uh, present-day Turkey, uh, that within a few years of Paul writing this was going to be depopulated and destroyed. I think there was an earthquake or something. They were conquered. I, I my history, pardon me, that's a bad thing for a history major to say. <laughs> but the, the, the church had adopted what seems to be some kinds of ideas coming out of Gnosticism. There was also some other speculative and esoteric thinking and maybe some hold over Jewish practices. And all in all, it was kind of a mess in Colossae. And it was difficult for people to tell what the Christian movement stood for because, in essence, it stood for everything. Christianity, Gnosticism, mystery, religious thinking, Judaism, all kinds of ideas from disparate arms of the movement all sort of mishmashed together in the churches. This was not a good situation for the witness of the Christian movement. And so Paul writes to correct that. He writes to take, get them to think about what they're doing, about what they're saying, about what they're believing, about how they're acting. And he does it by pointing to the, the majesty of Jesus. He does it by, by singing these hymns to Jesus. And pointing to Jesus' sole, ultimate rulership and stewardship over all creation. He speaks about Jesus' work of reconciliation. An act that he was able to perform through his death and resurrection. So he begins by telling the Colossians about kings and kingdoms. And he tells the, these people, these apparently confused, misguided people, he tells them that he wants them to grow in strength so that they can endure all things and give thanks. And they should be thankful to God because God has transferred them from a, a, a world of darkness, which is a, in some ways probably a phrase that was more familiar with the Gnostics than the Christians into a new world, into a kingdom of, of, of the beloved Son. Now, you, you've heard me say before that instead of kingdom, I like to think in terms of vision, because it isn't a place. You see, it isn't, it isn't a, a, a geographic area that he's talking about. But he's talking about a way of living, a way of, of a life of relationships. And the Colossians, he says, need to understand that at, just as a conquering king might come in and after he has conquered people, he transfers their citizenship from that old world, that old kingdom, into his kingdom, the, 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 the conqueror's kingdom, the conqueror's empire. God in Jesus has done that for the Colossians. Formerly they lived in a world of darkness and now they live in the vision of God's beloved Son who has brought salvation and redemption. This is an important word, obviously. And it's one that in some ways it would probably be easier for, as I said, for the Colossians to understand because they had this 
apparently had this exposure to Gnosticism. And we can talk about that at some point, but it doesn't really matter today. Paul doesn't even tell us what's going on in Colossae, he just hints at it. But in effect, it's as, as the words of Isaiah say, the people who had walked in darkness now dwell in light. They transferred their citizenship from an old world into a new, from a world of despair into a world of hope, from a world of obligation into a world of joy and giving. And then Paul sings a hymn. It, you wouldn't know it from, from reading his letter here, as we have it today. But this, the, 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 the verses um, 21, or rather, 15 through 20 are an ancient Christological hymn. They're a hymn about the person and the work of the Christ, the Messiah. And it's, it's a, they, they might have sung this in their services. They might have recited it to one another. And he says, Jesus Messiah is the very image of God. He's not a reflection. He's not a clone. He's not a copy. He's not an idol. He is the fullness of God in person. Now, that is not to say, I mean, don't take it too literally, that is not to say that if we could see the invisible God, that that, that person would look like Jesus, if we knew what Jesus looked like. He's not talking about a physical representation. He's talking about a person who is the fullness of God embodied in a human being. He is who God is in a human form, if you will. He's not just a copy. He is God. He is everything that God is. He is all that God wants us to be and to do. He's about what God is about in creation. And in fact, Jesus Messiah, Paul says, this Christological hymn says, Jesus Messiah is the agent of creation. Through Him, by Him, for Him, all things were made in heaven and on earth. He is the first. And in Him, all things hold together. Not only did Jesus create, not only was the one through whom God created, but God sustains all of creation through the person of Jesus. And not only was Jesus the firstborn, as it says, in the hymn, not only was he the first of the creation, which created a lot of problems in the early church. What does that mean, by the way? Not only was he the first, but he was the first to come back from the dead. He was the first fruits of re uh, resurrection. Uh, he was the first of what we're all going to be able to become. These new creatures. These new people. But then understand, this is not a, kind of a monetary kind of transaction that is taking place. This reconciliation that Jesus effected is not simply a matter of paying a debt that could not be paid. It is not simply a matter of appeasing an angry God whose bloodlust demanded satisfaction. Reconciliation is what God is about. Bringing all things together is what God is about. And in Jesus, God accomplishes that by bringing peace to all of creation through Jesus' gift on the cross. And in some way that we may never be able to understand on this earth. In some way that changes the world into the kind of place that God intended for it to be from the start. All the barriers, all the obstacles that exist between us and God are removed. And God says, come on home. 
You're welcome here. You're welcome in this relationship. I want you here. It's a new way of being in the world in which we get to share. We have not just a responsibility, but a privilege of sharing with God, with Jesus Messiah, and our stewardship of creation, and their stewardship of creation. We get the opportunity to participate with God in bringing peace and justice into the world. We have an opportunity, a privilege, an open door through which we can walk. Somehow, the gift of Jesus on the cross righted every wrong and created new life. It introduced a newer and deeply abiding hope into a dark and hopeless world. This is the work, the Apostle says, this is the work for which the Colossians should give thanks. And it's the work for which we should give thanks as well, because what the Apostle wrote to the, to the Colossian churches, someone could write to us today with equal clarity and with equal import. Everything that was said to these Colossian Christians, we could say to one another. See, there are all sorts of people in this world calling themselves Christians who are going to put or would like to put demands on our lives that I'm not sure really make a lot of sense. There are people who would tell us that we have to hate people who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, whatever, because God hates them. And we can't, we can't be Christians if we love them. There are people who would tell us that, <coughs> excuse me, that if we vote for a political party, then we have to vote for their political party because God hates the other one, and we can't love what God hates. There would be people who would tell us that we don't have to worry about peace and justice. We don't have to worry about matters of ecology. All that's going to get sorted out at the end of time. All we have to do is preach salvation. Everything else doesn't really matter. There are people who would tell us all sorts of things. But I don't think God would want us to hear. Perfect, to be perfectly frank. Now, I'm not going to say they can't preach that. They're doing the kinds of things they believe God wants them to do. But I'm afraid, I, I worry, that they're going to miss the boat, that they, they misunderstood, and it's going to take God's grace to make things right, and as it is for all of us. But I don't read what those folks are saying in the Bible. What I read in the Bible is that God tells us to love one another. And it doesn't say, love this group and don't love that group. It says, love one another. And people are going to know that we are Christians by this. That we love one another. What I read in the Bible, what I read in, in, in the, the, the Christian scriptures, is that God does not judge us by whom we exclude from fellowship. But God looks at us to see who we include. What I read in the Gospels, in the good news of Jesus Messiah, is that we have the task, we have the mission to care for this world. Because we are the reflection of God's stewardship. We are not the owners. 
But it, this, this, this world, this wonderful, magical, beautiful, extravagant world is ours to tend like a garden. Not to destroy, not to exploit, but to care for and to use responsibly and carefully and prayerfully. That's what I want. Peace and justice matter. Stewardship matters. Loving matters. Giving of ourselves matters. It all matters because we can't separate these things out from one another. We have been transferred. Our citizenship has been transferred from a world of darkness to a world of light. To the vision of God's beloved Son. In this season, we've been considering our support for the ministries of University Baptist Church. And as we have considered, I would like for us further to keep in mind this concept of peace and justice through stewardship. Through Jesus Messiah, God created all things. And through Jesus Messiah, God sustains all things. <clears throat> Jesus reigns in all of creation, whether the creation recognizes it or not. God has reconciled all of creation to God's self by making peace. Our stewardship of all things is a reflection of God's stewardship. It is our opportunity. We work for peace and justice in our stewardship because God has reconciled all things to God's self. How can we do other? How can we do less? In most of the bulletins today, there is a pledge card. And in a little while, we'll ask you to, to fill those out. You can just give them to us in the, the, uh, in the offering plates as they pass later. But through these last weeks, we have examined and meditated on the universality of God. We have talked about putting our thought into action. We have talked about God's peace and how God has reconciled all of the world, all of creation, to God's self. And now is our time, is our opportunity to participate, to act, to put our thought into action as we make a promise to one another, really. Make a promise to one another to support the ministries of this congregation. We're not asking, I don't ask that for any of us to support a budget. That isn't what it's about. What it's about is what we do. What it's about is our ministry. Our participation with NSI, Neighborhood Services Incorporation, Incorporated. Our participation with bread. Our participation with the university area. Our participation with the university itself. All the things that we do as individuals and as a community. That's what we're supporting. That's what we're supporting. God's reconciling peace at work in the world. That's what we're supporting. Making God known in all places and in all times. I ask all of us to support the ongoing work of reconciling peace in this congregation, in this community, and in the wider world. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have given us so much. You have given us everything. I ask that you touch our hearts, that you convict us, help us to hear the opportunity that is before us, and to put our thought into action as we work for your reconciling peace. Come be in us, among us, and work through us, we pray in Jesus' name.